stress, frustration, anger, disillusion, alienation, loneliness. That's what 4-Track Demos is about. Polly Jean Harvey recorded these 14 demos after a nervous breakdown. She decided to release them as an album when she had lost her band, the only thing she had left. After all her hard work, it looked like the accolades of fans and critics alike might all come to naught. What's the story behind the songs? What was Harvey trying to achieve by releasing them in this form? Did they sound good? Let's find out in this episode of If Music Could Talk. October 1993, Dorset. PJ Harvey has turned 24. She's a runaway success. 30 months and two albums into her career in music, she has the critics eating out of her hand. The buying public is raving about her. She's Rolling Stone's Best Artist and Best Singer-Songwriter of the Year in 1992. But something's rotter in Dorset. Her trio has disbanded due to internal friction, the last bit of her youth that is gone for good. BJ questions her future and what she should do. On the 19th of October, four track demos appears on the record shop shelves. It's a 47 minutes collection of home demos she perfected and recorded a little more than a year before. The music came at a very intense time for Harvey, who was fresh from a nervous breakdown. It all started in 1991, when she had to put all of herself in her music career. Her trio, also called PJ Harvey, had initially faced open hostility. Her first gig ever was actually in a skittle alley in Dorset. And so, yeah, we started playing. I suppose there were about 50 people there. And with the first song, we cleared the hall. There was about two people left. And a woman came after us, uh, came out to my drummer. We were three peas while we were playing and shouted at him. And she realized nobody likes you. We'll pay you. You can stop playing. We'll still pay you. I pretty much wanted to give up at that point. Well, she didn't. The trio recorded their first album, Dry, released in March 1992. Incessant touring followed. The accolades, the demands, poor eating habits, the tumultuous breakdown of PJ's first serious love affair with Joe Dilworth. Too much. In autumn 1992, less than a year after moving to London, Polly Jean retreated to her parents' farm in Dorset. In a near manic state, she started working on her second album, Rid of Me. Resting in that quiet rural county, she produced abrasive, hard edged, aggressive music. Of course she did, with all that sh coming through. Now, in 1993, Ten days after her 24th birthday, Harvey is releasing that music in its original form. Polly Jean, alone, singing and playing guitar and a few other instruments that appear from time to time. Why? Was this a desperate attempt to scrape the barrel before one final breakdown? No, it wasn't. To understand that, we need to go back a little. Hello, Top Potters, this is Simon Mask a guy with a master degree in music who is not ashamed of admitting it. Welcome to this episode of If Music Could Talk. PJ Harvey already had a history of releasing demo material. The first pressing of Dry included a bonus CD, Demonstration Dry. It included one demo version of each song of the album. Harvey had considered doing the same with Read of Me, but then she went with the single record release. Like Dry, Rid of Me drew inspiration from the music Harvey had listened to growing up. John Lee Hooker, Howling Wolf, Robert Johnson, Jimi Hendrix, Neil Young and the Rolling Stones, among others. She had a clear vision about the kind of record she wanted to release. 
I wanted to get a sound that was as live as possible and a lot of blues records and the Led Zepp records were recorded live. But the process of hammering a record out was not easy. The first sessions at the manor on Shipton on Cherwell, Oxfordshire, were a failure. PJ couldn't concentrate. I don't know whether it was her or her label, Island, to suggest the next step. The trio went to Cannon Falls, Minnesota, a quiet midwestern town in the States, home of Pachyderm Studio. The studio, armed with a Neve 8068 recording console, the same used in Jimi Hendrix's Electric Lady Studios, was booked for two weeks. Steve Albini was to be the producer. Harvey knew Albini and his work with Pixies, Slint, The Breeders, and the Jesus Lizard. She felt he was the right person for this job. He was. During a 1993 interview for MTV's 120 Minutes, PJ said Albini is the only person I know that can record a drum kit and it sounds like you're standing in front of a drum kit. That is why I wanted to work with him, because all I ever wanted is for us to be recorded and to sound like we do when we're playing together in a room. If Freedom of Me sounded good to Harvey then, why release the demos? Why adding six unreleased songs in place of some of the Rhythm Me tracks? In 2004, Harvey declared that Albini had something to do with the decision. He liked the demos. He felt that they added another dimension to the songs, one that couldn't be achieved in a studio setting with a band. That's probably why she has released one record of demos for each of her releases, starting from July 2020. But there had to be more to the release of 4-track demos. Here you have a woman who said her music was getting more praise than it deserved, that everything was happening too quickly. She refused to appear at Lulapalooza because she wanted to work in small venues and build the connection with the audience. So, watch the interviews from that era. You see PJ remarking how this or that idea came from when she was younger. This was not worrying about getting old in the forever young world of music business. This was the kind of stuff you say when you need to defend something you have outgrown. Four track demos was not a desperate way to cling to the past. It was a way to remind people how much PJ Harvey was responsible for her own sound now that her trio had disbanded. A way to say goodbye to that trio, to the music of her teens, to the persona critics and fans thought she was. PJ Harvey had not grown all that. Is this album worth your attention? If you're a musician or a composer, four track demos teaches you a lesson. Appreciate the completeness of the music, even at demo stage. The lyrics are there, the structures work, and so do the arrangements despite the sparse instrumentation. They can buy one voice, two guitars, and it sounds like it needs nothing else. This saves a lot of time and money during the actual production. But there's a lot for casual listeners too. Like Albini said, the lack of extra instruments can add another layer to the meaning of the songs. Take rid of me, faster, more intense than the band version. And when the chorus comes and you expect a big boom, the lack of bass and drums is disappointing. The music seemed to say, be as messing as you like, it's only going to frustrate you more, to underline your helplessness. Throughout the album, PJ Harvey manipulates your emotions. You know she is, and you are aboard for the journey. Heavy stuff, but fair play. Careful with your first listening. Even if you don't pay attention to the lyrics, the first five songs are particularly intense. It's a sonic assault akin to that of Husker Du's Land Speed record, but that album is faster, more joyful. There is no joy here, only confusion, disappointment, and frustration. The relief you crave for comes at the right time with driving. Gradually, the material starts featuring a less granitic and more spacious sound. 
The music is more varied than you would think, judging from the project type alone. The guitar playing is skillful, the vocal delivery is convincing, and that's 95% of the music. The album shifts gear when it must. A second too late and the fatigued listener could turn it off. A second too early and the effort might seem less monolithic, feverish and obsessive. The game PJ Harvey is playing with you would fall apart. Give 4-track demos some breathing time. You need to let the experience sediment. You need to ponder about the questions the album leaves open, like… Is this a feminist album? It depends on your definition. If all you need is a strong woman talking about something from a woman's point of view, then yes, this can be a feminist album. But what if I cover the material? Does it become machist because I have a male voice? Let's hear it from Polly Jean herself. No, not about my singing about the feminist thing. I don't even think of myself as being female half of the time. When I'm writing songs, I never write with gender in mind. I write about people's relationships with each other. Miss Harvey is expressing ideas. It says a lot about one's view of women if one thinks that alone labels her a feminist. It would help if those making a case for her feminism would also talk about, say, her exquisite guitar playing. But maybe that kind of praise is reserved to boys. Is the material about PJ Harvey? Yes. No. In 1993, she was quoted saying, I would have to be 40 and very worn out to have lived through everything I write about. Then, in 1999, the tortured artist myth is rampant. People paint me as some kind of black witchcraft practicing devil from hell that I have to be twisted and dark to do what I'm doing. It's a load of rubbish. Harvey had a specific agenda for her music. At that time, I very much wanted to write songs that shocked. When I wrote Read of Me, I shocked myself. I thought, well, if I'm shocked, other people might be shocked. I knew this was the type of song I was trying to write. The nervous breakdown, the end of her affair with Dilworth, the escape from London must have crept into the music. How much hers are excuses and how much of the artist is in the music is for you to decide. Enough. Time to do your own listening. Write me a line with your own answers. There's not a lot more to say. Four track demos did close an era for PJ Harvey. Her music was never as raw or furious as it was until then. That doesn't mean that she sold out or ceased to put out intriguing work. In 1995, for example, she released the Bring You My Love. It was a summer affair, more reflective than her previous records. Some consider it her breakthrough. One must wonder what was left breaking through after Dry and Read of Me. But that's another story. This one closes here with a woman that believed in her gift in writing good music that could move an audience, in hard work, in making things just the way she wanted without excessive compromises. There is a universal beauty to this story in PJ Harvey achieving what she has. Naturally, this is not Hollywood, and Harvey had to give up something to pursue her vocation. In 1995, that year again, she stated that she loved children and she would have loved having some, but only if she could find a person she could spend the rest of her life with. So far, she hasn't been successful in that. Does she regret that? I can't tell. But if music could talk, it would probably say, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. And before that song makes me shed the usual tear, let's see where we can go from here. If you like 4-track demos, why not listen to its polished version? I'm talking about Read of Me. Or even better, Dry. I prefer the latter. I feel it's popular, in a sense. And since we are talking about 4-tracks, 
You got to listen to Husker Du's Land Speed Record and Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska. You want strong women heading a band? You owe Susie Sue a listen. My favorite is The Scream, but all the Banshees album have something worth your attention. More on the left field, one can talk about alternative rock in the early 90s without mentioning Nirvana. Check out Nevermind, of course. John Jett's bad reputation and the Runaways live in Japan are other distant but close choices. And how about X-Ray Specs's early material? That's enough to keep you busy, let's see if you can guess which of these albums I'll cover in the next episode. Keep your top hat on and see you soon! In 1995, I watched Strange Days. I love the film. That's how I learned of PJ Harvey. Read of Me was in the soundtrack. I rushed to the record shop and all they had was four track demos. I bought it. Listening to the demos could be the best way to get to know the essence of Harvey's music. I listened to it for the customary week. I kind of liked the album, but the Scar's instrumentation frustrated me. I wanted to think I loved raw essence. The truth was that I needed a more polished sound. I didn't listen to the album for 20 years, and then I gave it another chance. I'm happy I did. And you? What's your story with 4-track demos? Tell me in the comments, or join my Telegram channel and tell me over there. The link is in the description. Simon Mas, music you love.